So all the best. Uh, doctor, can you allow me to share my screen? Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah. Okay, can you share? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum and uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon. I wish to Dr. Nad and my fellow classmates. Uh, my name is Shasha Narsabiha Binti Sharadin, matrix number AS11875. Today I'll be presenting a summary on a, sub uh, on a subtopic of chapter 24, which is radioactive radiation. So let's begin. The first thing I'm going to talk about is what are radioactive radiations? Well, radioactive radiations is what happens when radioactive atoms uh, that pours out, that contain energy that pours out spontaneously as energet energetic subatomic particles or electromagnetic waves. The energy that pours out spontaneously is what we call radiation. Next, who discovered radioactive radiation? Well, it's this mustache gentleman right here. His name is Henry Becquerel. He accidentally discovered spontaneous radioactivity in March 1896. Uh, I'm not going to go further into this since unfortunately it is not in our uh, syllabus, but you guys can read it up on the internet. It's very interesting on how serendipity fell into his favor. Next, I'm going to talk about the types of radiation. I am not going to go in depth into this as my friends Nick and Ishraf will be explaining it further later on. But I am going to tell you guys about the basics. Well, there are three types of radiation. Uh, the first one being alpha particles or alpha radiation. So above here is the symbol of alpha radiation. It has the heaviest particles and it is positively charged. Next, we have beta radiation and the particles of beta radiation is much lighter compared to the particles of alpha uh, and it is negatively charged. And over here, up here is the um, symbol of beta radiation. And next we have gamma radiation. Above here is the symbol of gamma radiation. It is not a particle. However, it is a wave of pure energy and it has no mass and no charge. Next, I am going to talk about penetrating power. So what is penetrating power? Well, penetrating power is defined as the power that a type of radiation has to pass through or penetrate certain materials. That means if a type of radiation cannot pass through a material like paper, it indicates that its penetrating power is weak. Alternatively, if a type of radiation cannot pass through a thick slab of lead, that indicates that its penetration power is strong. However, so over here, I have three types of materials, uh, paper, aluminum, and lead. Let's see which out of these three types of radiation has the weakest penetrating power and the strongest penetrating power. So let's start off with alpha radiation. As you can see here, alpha radiation cannot pass through paper. That means it has the weakest penetrating power out of the three radiation. Next, beta radiation. As you can see, Beta radiation cannot pass through aluminum. That means it has a strong penetrating power than alpha radiation, but it's not the strongest out of the three. Next, gamma radiation. As you can see over here, gamma radiation cannot pass through a thick slab of lead. That means it has the strongest penetrating power out of the three radiation. That is all from me today. Thank you so much for listening and have a nice day. Thanks, Shasha. The animations was good. Uh, next is Nick or Ishra. 
uh, is uh, Nick first. All right. Um, you can hear me, right? And see my screen? Yes. All right. So, um, good evening, everybody, and assalamualaikum. So, um, my name is Nick Alicia Binti Nick Muhammad Zaki, AS12003 and K19, uh, obviously. And my topic is radioactive radiations, specifically alpha particles. So, first, what is an alpha particle? An alpha particle. Um, forms when due to the disintegration of a larger atom's nucleus. So maybe uh, bismuth or uranium, and this bismuth or uranium disintegrates and forms this little guy here. This little guy here is an alpha particle. It has two protons, say the blue ones, and two neutrons, say the orange, red ones? Yeah, red ones. And it's also known as a positively charged helium nucleus. Since it has two protons, which have a positive charge, it has a plus two charge since it's two protons, yeah. So what are the characteristics of an alpha particle, you ask? Well, like Shasha mentioned earlier, they are large. They have a mass of four AMU, which to me and you is quite small since it's like the size of a helium particle. But against beta and gamma, it's quite big. They're also weak in penetrating power, which can, uh, they can only be stopped by a piece of paper. So yeah, and next they are slow, which they only move at about 30,000 kilometers per second, which again, to me and you is really fast, but to beta and gamma rays, which can move up to the speed of light, it's very slow. So since now you know about alpha particles, you got to know about alpha decay. So what is alpha decay? Alpha decay is when an unstable isotope emits radioactive radiations which is true for all radioactive radiations, but for alpha decay specifically, it emits this alpha particle, obviously. <laughs> alpha decay is when um, they release this helium-4 nucleus here. So now you need to know the characteristics of uh, alpha decay. So characteristics of alpha decay are here. Um, so we have this equation over here, which is the alpha decay equation. And this is an example, which is the previous thing you saw just now. So like I mentioned, alpha decay pro um, produces this helium uh, for nucleus, which is also the alpha particle and this product over here. And this product has four minus four in nuclear number is a nuclear number less than four. And it has less by two protons and two neutrons. So it's nuclear number as well goes down, eh, sorry, it's neutron number goes down by two. So as you can see here, it's two, two, six. Now it's 222 because it's minus four and it's 88 here. And now it's 86 because it's minus two here. And the extra part, the extra, the from here, the 226, the extra four go here into this alpha particle. So uh, that is all from me for now. Thank you. Smiley face. Smiley face, can I tell Thanks, Nick. That was good. Uh, moving on, Ishra. Ishra, tak kisa. Are you there? Oh, tak ngaku eh. Nama dia Ishraf tak kisah. Okay, tak apa. Oops. Ishraf, you're muted. Ah, okay. Can you see his leg? Yep. Okay. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to Dr. Nadia Husseini and my fellow friends. So my name is Muhammad Ishraf bin Ismail uh, with method number 12252 and today I will explain about radioactive radiation and my part is to explain about the beta and gamma rays. So what 
are beta and gamma particles. A beta particle, also called beta ray or beta radiation symbol, B is a rare high energy, high speed electron or positron emitted by the radioactive decay of an atomic nucleus during the process of beta decay. There are two forms of beta decay, which is beta decay minus and beta positive decay, which produce electrons and positrons respectively. While a gamma, partic a gamma particle, also called gamma ray, occurs due to transition of the excited nucleus to a lower energy state after emitting photons. It has shortest wavelength, electromagnetic wave, and so impart the highest photon energy. The, so basically, the beta particles, uh, also like alpha particles, which is occur due to disintegration of nucleus, while gamma particles occur due to transition of excited nucleus to a lower energy state after emitting photon. So next, uh, this is the the image that I got from Google or Bing that show beta minus decay and beta plus decay plus the gamma decay. So next we go to the equation. So basically the beta, uh, the atomic number, number of neutron and the number of proton in the product is more by one after the decay, uh, which means the product has Z plus one proton, but it only has Z electron. But the gamma decay, the mass number and the atomic number of nucleus remains the same. So the difference between the gamma and beta rays is um, beta rays can only penetrate few millimeter of aluminum, while gamma can particles highly penetrative and can penetrate up to several centimeters of lead. Like uh, this photo that has been explained by the Shasha before. So how do we identify them? Uh, we basically use the ionization detector uh, that the gamma particle will go straight and the beta will be in curve because it is attractive to the positive magnetic field. So I think that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thanks Ishra. Next is okay. Well done for the subtopic just now. Uh, apa tak nama dia lupa saya. The next one is Sapakri, Sapakri, and then Kristina and Nisha. Korang siapa nak start dulu? Ah, uh, saya doktor. Alright, Sapakri eh. Alright, all the best. Can you see now, Doctor? Boleh. Oh, okay, good. So, Assalamualaikum and very pleasant day I bid to all of you. My name is Muhammad Zofakri. And today, I'm going to present decay curve and half-life. To be exact, I'm going to present about the theories for this part. So, when we talk about decay and half-life, it's very important to discuss and know about the radioactivity first. So radioactivity is the spontaneous and random decay of an unstable nucleus with the emission of alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. This random decay process means there is no way to tell which nucleus will decay and cannot predict when it's going to decay. That's why we scientists propose the, some formulas so that we can estimate the time that the radioactive will decay. 
Okay, now we're moving on to the decay curve. Decay curve is the graphic representations of the rate of decay of a radioactive isotope of an element. So based on this picture, we can this is an example of unknown substances. So on the y-axis, we have number of nucleus, and at the x-axis, we have time in multiples or the half-life. Okay, so let's take a look at the example. At the at time zero, the initial value of number the initial number of nucleus is 1 million. But after the first half-life, which is 500, then the rate, the rate drops at the first half-life, which is at T half. It's supposed to be a number here, but since this is an example, then let's say the first half-life is going to be in 55 seconds. Then we can say that the first half-life, which the substance decreases to half number of its original number, then it's going to be the half-life. In this case, it's dropped from 1 million to 500, and it continues from 5 million, 500,000 to 250,000. And that is the concept of decay curve. Now, we're moving on to the half-life. Half-life of a radioactive substance is the number time taken for the is the time taken for the number of nuclei of the radioactive substance decay to half of its initial. It's very related to the decay curve. And to get more understanding in this case, I already prepared an uh, analogy time for you guys. Okay, so imagine in one fine day, uh, you have eight ships at your farm and there's a delivery guy or wolf who pretend like a delivery guy come to give you something. But actually, this wolf wants to eat your ships. So, at the first day, we have eight ships. And after that, your ships decreases to four. That means the number is decreases to half of its original number. And this decreasing situation, we call it as the first half-life. Then, on the next day, it decreases from four to two number of ships. and it continues until it becomes one number, one ships only. And every situation from the original, it decreases to the, to the half of it. We call it half-life. And from this, we can find that one day is equal to the half-life of the ship were eaten by the wolf. And half-life is one day. It depends on the situation. Let's say if the first day is going to be the eight, eight ships, and Maybe in the, in the next two days, the number will be decreases half from its original. Then the half-life is going to be two days. But in this situation, the half-life is one day only. So based on this analogy, we, it same goes to the real situation when we talk about the radioactive of an isotope decay, which is from the original number of nuclei. It decreases to half of its original, which is from 1 million to 500 thousand for example and from five hundred thousand it decreases to two hundred fifty thousands and this is the half life and the second half life on the situation half life is going to go is going to be till the end of the time because you know we cannot radioactive substances cannot simply gone like that for example like what happened to Hiroshima and Nagasaki nowadays even though it was during 1900s and from now until now we cannot visit the Hiroshima and the city of Nagasaki because they still have a radioactive substance and radiates the city which is very dangerous for us and half-life and of, a, of an isotope can be from as millisecond and up to four years like what happened in Japan just now I mentioned and some medical stuff that use half-life it can destroy in milliseconds and that is all from me i hope you enjoy thank you good analogy Fakri. that was really really good i really enjoyed it okay moving on Misha or welcome Okay. Do you hear me? Yep. Uh, screen pun nampak. 
Okay, all the best. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Kristina Binti al Kanil and my matrix number is ESPS12107. So today I'll be presenting the topic, the subtopic about the key curves and half lives, which is um I'll be presenting all the equation that you need you guys need to know in this subtopic. So first of all is you need to know the equation of the to find the rate of the decrease in the number of nuclei, which is A. So A is equals to delta N over delta T equals to negative lambda N, or you can use delta N over N equals to negative lambda delta T, which is T is time, N is the number of nuclei, and lambda is the lambda is the decay constant uh, for the decay process. The value of the lambda will determine the rate uh, at which the material will decay. So in order to find n, we need to use this equation, which is the number of nuclei at any time t can be calculated by using by solving the equation that is n is equals to n naught e to the power of t half, which is n is the number of nuclei and n naught is the number of nuclei at time zero. So when we talk about decay curves and half lives, obviously we will have the equation that related to half lives. So when the number of nuclei has reduced to half of its initial value, we will have this equation, which is n naught over two is equals to n naught to e to the power of negative lambda t half. So or you can just easily use t half is equals to ln two over lambda, or it is equals to zero point six. 39 over lambda. So that is all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for the summary. Nanti submit eh? uh, your summary so that everyone can use some more punya summaries lah, basically. Eh, kejap ada pegangguan pula. Lepas ni, Nisha kan? Yes, Doctor. Okay. All the best, Nisha. Um. Uh, okay, can you see? Okay, Nisha. <laughs> okay. Um, Assalamualaikum and a very good day I bid to Dr. Nat and all of you. My name is Khairun Nisha of Nabita Azman, AS12337. And my subtopic is DK Curve and Half-Lives. And I will cover on the questions. So for the first question, what is the activity of a sample of carbon-14 that contains 3.1 times 10 to the power of 20 nuclei, given the decay constant is 3.9 times 10 to the power of negative 12 per second? So as we, as Christina mentioned before, we use this activity formula where negative lambda n. So we substitute the value of lambda, 3.9 10, 10 to the power of negative 12 and the, uh, multiply by 3.1 times 10 to the power of 20 and we will get negative 1.1 times 10 to the power of 9 back row. Second question, this is from a module by the way. So the half-life of radioisotopes is 3 hours. Find the decay constant of the isotope. So um, First, we change the unit to second, and we know that the formula of half-life is ln 2 over lambda. And we reorganize this formula, and we'll get ln 2 over lambda, eh, the half-life. And the answer is 6.42 times 10 to the power of negative 5 per second. Third, cobalt-60 isotope decay with half-life of 5.26 years. What is the activity of 10 gram of this isotope? So the, the question wants activity. So we have to use uh, the formula lambda n. But first, we have to find the value of n by using this equi this formula, where mass times um, Avogadro constant and divide by the molar mass of the isotope. And the value is 1.0033 times 10 to the power of 23 nuclei. And then uh, we substitute the value of n here into this formula. Um, this formula is from the formula of half-life and we reorganize and we will get ln 2 over the half-life. And we solve these um, values and we will get 4.19 times 10 to the power of 
14 becquerel. For B, what will its activity after 10 years? So we use this formula and we have to only substitute the value A from A question. And the half-life given here is 5.26 years and the T is 10 years. And the answer is 1.12 times 10 to the power of 14 becquerel. And the last question, a drug pack with half-life of 9.05 hours is prepared for a patient if the original activity of the sample was 1.1 times 10 to the power of 4 becquerel, what is its activity after it has sat on the shelf for 2 hours? So we use the same formula as the previous question and we substitute all the values. Um, A given here 1.1 times 10 to the power of 4 and the half-life is 9.05 hours and the time is 2 hours and the answer is 9.44 times 10 to the power of 3 becquerel. And that is all from me. Thank you for listening and have a good day. Thanks, Nisha. <laughs> that was nice. Uh, it was very colorful and I enjoyed the problem. Next is the mm, mm, Nisha, Shakira, Zahilda and Umar. Go, korang boleh figure out siapa nak go first. I don't mind. Doctor. For my subtopic, actually, I share with Nadira and Jaya Dipan. Oh, okay. And sorry. Jaya Dipan so will go first, and then Nadira, and then follow by me. Okay. So the next one is Shakira, then? Uh, yeah, Shakira so and Zahilda? Yeah, All right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Shakira binti Osman. My matrix number is AS11998. Today I will present the subtopic of uses of radioactive decay. For the first example of uses of radioactive decay is carbon dating. It used beta decay of 14 carbon to date uh, organic samples. For example, wooden or archaeological artifacts or ancient human remain from the distant past. It's date organic samples as old as about 16, 2000 years. The ratio, uh, the ratio of 14 carbon to 12 carbon is used. Carbon-14 is considered as radioactive isot uh, considered a radioactive isotope of carbon because it is unstable. Carbon-14 will eventually decay to carbon-12 isotopes. This is the example of machine that use uh, carbon dating application. For the first one is accelerator mass spectrometer, which is uh, in this or in the short form is AMS. AMS is widely used in archaeology for radiocarbon dating application. And for the second example machine that use carbon dating is liquid scintillation counter. Uh, in a short form is LSC. LSC is a standard laboratory method to quantify the radioactivity of low energy radioisotope. Mostly beta, beta emitting and alpha emitting isotopes. So this is uh, the example machine that use carbon dating application. The last uh, use of radioactive decay is smoke detectors. They actually have two smoke, uh, two type smoke detectors. One is ionization type smoke detectors, and what uh, another is photoelectric type smoke detectors. But 
we will talk about ionization type smoke detectors because it uses a radioactive source to ionize the air in chamber. So this is uh, what happened in the smoke detectors, which is a button and current are maintained. And when smoke enters the, the chamber, the current is decreased and the alarm is sounds. To make it more clear, let's see the diagram. Okay, this diagram, we can see there are two tiny metal plates, which called is electrodes, that connected to the battery. And it should be like a circuit. And for a second, there is also a substance called americium 241. Americium 241 is actually a radioactive source. And it converts air molecules into positive and negative ions. So because of opposite attracts, the negative ion will move towards the positive plate and the positive ion will move to the negative plates. And because of that, it will create a, a complete, create a complete circuit or a path of electricity. But when smoke enter the smoke alarm, the ions bond with the smoke. And because of it, it will breaking the path of electricity. It's not like before. Um, and then the flow of electricity will reduce, then the alarm will go off. Uh, that's all from me, thank you. Good job, Shakira. That was a really good explanation. Moving on, Zahilda. Well done. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Assalamualaikum. I'm very good morning. I beg to Dr. Nadia and all my fellow classmates. Today, me, Norza Yilda, Bitu Mazapan, will present the summary of uses of radioactive decay under the topic nuclear physics. Outside of nuclear power and nuclear weaponry, there remains a wide array of ways in which radioactive material and the radiation uh, give or remain useful in the daily life of people. Uh, so, uh, tak bergerak slide awak. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, one of the uses uh, that we use is radioactive traces. So, um, uh, radioactive traces is made up of carrier molecules. They are bonded tightly to a radioactive atom. And this carrier molecule very greatly depending on the purpose of the scan. So, um, one of the application that we use radioactive traces is PET scan. So PET is stand for positron emission tomography and PET scan uh, is an imaging test that allows doctor to check for disease in our body. So um, uh, these traces are either swallow, inhale or inject in body depend on part of body that we being examined. So um, the PET scan use radio from to create 3D image, 3D image or radio pharmaceutical is a radio isotope that bond to biological molecule that able to target specific organ and tissue in our human body. Mm, did we lose Sahilda? Okay, dah dah hilang kejap. Dah dah you back? Okay, sorry doktor. Okay, <laughs> boleh share balik. Uh, awak hab Habis dekat PET scan tadi. And, oh. So PET use radio yeah, pharmaceutical to... Tak apa, relax je. It's okay. Jan, kumping now. Jan, kumping now. Ha, dengar anak saya cakap Jan, kumping now. Jan, kumping now. Iklan, iklan. Okay, dah nampak dah. 
Okay, um, PET scan use radio formatical to create 3D image. The radio formatical is a radio isotope bonds to biological molecule that able to target specific organ, tissue, or cell in human body. So the decay of radio tracer uh, used in PET scan is a uh, uh, they, they produce small particle which we call positron. The positron is a subatomic particle with positive charge, but it is not proton. Uh, the positron is same mass with electron, but it has different charge. The positron will be add with electron uh, in body. And when these two particles combine, uh, they will annihilate each other. They will destroy each other. And this annihilation produces a small amount of energy in the form of two protons that shoot off in opposite direction. And the detectors in PET scan measure this photon used for information to create image of internal organ. And this laser mostly uh, will detect uh, in higher chemical activity, which is helpful because certain Tissue and disease have high level of chemical activity. And this area of disease will show up as a bright spot on PET scan. PET scan uh, can measure the blood flow, oxygen use, level sugar, and much more. Second, SPET scan, which is single photon emission computed tomography. The SPET the SPECT, um, is used. Um, radioactive material, uh, which is a gamma, gamma ray, um, and the gamma, uh, which is SPCT, uh, has a gamma chemical that has uh, detected the gamma ray emission from the traces that they have injected into the patient. The chemical will protect um, and allow the detector to move in a tight circle around a patient. So the difference between the SPET scan and PET scan, which a uh, PET scan, um, they use positron and the SPST use, use gamma ray. So uh, the example when we do SPET scan, the radioactive tracer we insert it through the IV and then uh, the tracer we circulate through the body. And while uh, the patient lay on the table, the, camera, the gamma camera will rotate around the body. And then the camera will create 3D image, gear and tissues. Uh, That's all for me. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ahilda. Oh boy, comelnya. Next one is uh, Umar Jaya and Night Mango. Uh, I'll uh, be presenting, Doctor. <laughs> okay, all right. Doctor, can you see my slides? Yep, boleh. Go for it. All the best. Okay. <clears throat> A good afternoon, I'd like to wish to Dr. Nadia and my fellow classmates. So um, as we know, today might be the last presentation of our ASASI. So let's go and get on with it. And um, my name is Jay Rupin, uh, matrix number AS12083, and I'll be presenting about nuclear reactions, mostly uh, focus on the theory part. Noon Nadira will be presenting about the calculations, and Umar will be presenting about uh, exercises and questions. So a rough content on my presentation. Firstly, I'll present on what is a nuclear reaction, nuclear energy, nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, radiation, and quarks. So um, as we know, nuclear reactions is, uh, is when nucleus changes to another one or more nucleus by losing or gaining one or more of its nucleon. So as we have learned in uh, chemistry before, nucleon is the total sum of number of proton and neutron in the nucleus of an atom. So when changing from parent to daughter nucleus, energy is released. So if you're asking me how does a nu nucleus change to a new daughter cell, so uh, it is able to change its nucleon number by emitting particles or radiation. So in this, we must always remember that this nuclear reaction must obey the conservation of atomic number and conservation of mass number, which simply means that it has to be similar to its parent element. So moving on, let's talk about nuclear energy, also known as nukes. 
so uh, in a nuclear reaction total energy is conserved and uh, energy released in a nuclear reaction is mostly because of its change in mass during the interaction and amount of reaction energy is known as the q value of the reaction and this will be further explained by nadira in her calculations part so guys let's move on to nuclear fission so nuclear fission is a process whereby a bigger nucleus splits into a smaller nucleus usually is induced by uh, when particles such as neutron bombards with this uh, bigger nucleus so i've prepared an animation here for you guys so as we can see this white matter is a nucleus and uh, this bigger uh, uh, that white matter is a neutron sorry and this bigger matter here is uranium so when this neutron bombards with this uranium this uranium nucleus splits into two more smaller other elements and produces neutron as well so these two other elements uh, two neutrons and also produces fission energy so there are two other neutrons because these neutrons will further go and bombard with other bigger nucleus and cause them to fissionize into two smaller uh, nucleus and this will create a chain reaction where it is the concept that is applicated in atomic bomb where more chain reaction occurs in a less time span which causes this huge bombastic blast that was uh, put on in Hiroshima and Nagasaki so let's move on to nuclear fusion so nuclear fusion is a process whereby two nucleus of low mass number combines to form a large nucleus of higher binding energy so as we can see here uh, the deuterium and the tritium uh, hydrogen atom a hydrogen nucleus uh, combines to form helium which produces neutron and fusion energy so this concept uh, is applicated in the sun so this is how the sun has been burning all this well for billion of years on high heat and it is able to radiate heat towards us on planet earth so guys uh, i hope you have been uh, focusing on this presentation because i have a question for you so which reaction do you think produces more energy fission or fusion can i get some volunteers to answer so sarah uh, sophia is saying fission oh fission okay so i would like to say that uh, i have an analogy for this so don't mind me yeah so i have considered fission as a breakup and fusion is when you form a new partner so you are definitely more energetic when you find a new girlfriend or a boyfriend so thus when you find a new boyfriend you're more energetic so i would like to conclude fusion releases more energy compared to fission so sara you can use my analogy in the exams yeah and uh, so this this uh, raised the big question in my mind so why is there no fusion nuclear power plant when fusion energy can release about four times more energy than a fusion reaction and for fun fact this is simply because a fusion reaction cannot occur on planet earth because it requires a temperature of at least 100 million degrees celsius which is six times hotter than the core of the sun so scientifically and logically it is not possible on planet earth to articulate this temperature and uh, moving on we're talking about radiation radiation is almost everywhere so uh, exposure to high levels of radiation can cause harm to exposed tissue of human bodies and in the long term can result in cancer and other health issues so the best way to uh, remember on how to like uh, stay away from this radiation is time distance and shielding so time reduce the time of exposure when you're out there in the sun use a uh, high uv protected uh, sun lotion distance yourself from this radioactive material so let's just say we are conducting a lab experiment instead of using hands or to handle this uh, radioactive experiments use forceps and shielding is by simply using thick protective gears or materials and for the last part I'd like to present about quarks so quarks is uh, defined as an elementary particle or a fundamental constituent of matter which combines to form composite particles so this is how i like to put it on uh, simple terms i have always wondered that what is the smallest thing smallest ever uh, minute particle because we know humans are made up of body cells and then body cells are made up of proton and neutron but what makes up proton and neutron so the answer is quarks guys quarks makes up proton and neutrons so protons are made up of two up quarks and one down quark and neutron is made up of two down quark and one up quark so i hope this presentation was fruitful to you and thank you for your time and listening to me arigato wow that was awesome jaya thanks 
Um, next is nak mengko or Umar tapi kan Amsha cakap apa ni Amsha please uh, dia cakap doktor accept my follow request request mana ni Miss Ina 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 Yes, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, kalau saya tak follow bagi tahu eh. Saya, saya tak tahu nama kurang yang pelik-pelik kat IG ni. Okay, so next one is Umar or Nat Mango. It's me, doctor. Okay, all the best. Yeah, sorry, Doctor Ira. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum and good afternoon to Doctor Nat and to my fellow friends. So today, I'll be talking about nuclear physics. But the subtopic is the nuclear reaction equation, but mainly on the equation. So let's get on to it. So here is not the equation. It's just a, it's just a reaction between this uh, in the animation here. So as you can see, the parent nucleus, uh, sorry, the party is bombarded by particle A. What does it mean by bombarded? It means like it's to direct high energy particles against the nucleus to produce the nuclear transformation, or in simple words, attack. So part, so as you can see in this animation here. Uh, the particle A will attack the parent nucleus, which is at rest, which is X, and it will change to the daughter nucleus Y with the emission of the particle B. Um, but I will not go deep down into this as a few of our friends will present about this uh, reaction. So we're moving on. Okay, so this reaction energy, uh, it's mainly the Q value. The Q value is the amount of energy absorbed or released during the nuclear reaction. So the equation here is Q is equal to, in the bracket, masses of the particle A at, uh, plus with the masses of the parent nucleus X minus with the mass of the daughter nucleus Y minus the mass of the particle B times with the C square. Where C is constant, which is uh, C is equal to 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meter per second. There is even the short uh, form of the equation, which is Q is equal to masses of the reactants, which is the alpha, uh, the mass of the alpha, uh, sorry, sorry, mass of the particle A plus with the mass of the parent nucleus X minus with the masses of the product, which is the mass of the daughter nucleus Y and the mass of the particle B. So here... Uh, so here the m is the masses of each nucleus and particle but it is in kg and r is the reactants here p is the products and c here is the speed of light which is constant so okay. so here the conservation of energy enables the general definition of q based on the mass energy equivalence so here I uh, use the equation Q is equal to the final state of kinetic energy minus the initial state of the kinetic energy and you still get the initial masses which is the reactants minus the final masses which is the products times with the C square. These two can be expressed in terms of the binding energies of the nuclear species. L last week, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, last week, a few of our friends have presented about the nuclear binding energy, right? So here we can use uh, Q is equal to the final state of the binding energy minus the initial state of the binding energy. Not that the earlier Jaya mentioned that the atomic number and mass number are conserved. So here, by using the equation 1 and 2, 
the Rayleigh verb. So the sum of the binding energy and the rest mass energy for both reactants and products are the same. So when you rearrange everything, you will end, still end up getting this same equation here, which is Q in the bracket uh, mass of the reactants minus the mass of the products times Vc squared. So here we can say that the Q value is an important value for the nuclear reaction, which is this equation. So it's basically the uh, the most general equation. So that is it for my presentation. So that is all from me. Good day to all and to all, thank you for lending your ears. Thanks, Nat Mango. Well done. Next is Umar. Thank you, Doctor. Comelnya, tak cakap tak sesuai dengan Umar. Allah. Kalau memang main je memang. All the best. Yeah. Alright. <laughs> wait, wait, Fakri is disturbing me, sorry. Wait. Alright, Doctor, could you see it? Boleh, okay. Boleh. Or I'm I lagging. Uh, okay. Tak. Okay. Assalamualaikum and very good morning to Dr. Nat and my fellow friends. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you to Jaya and Nadira for explaining on what is our subtopic actually is. And for my part, I'm going to focus more on just the question session. So without further ado, let's start it. Okay, so here are some easy tips in order to answer all the questions. And trust me, the question is very easy. Okay, so the first tip is we need to remember on what is alpha, beta, and gamma represents in the equation. For example, here, here is what the alpha, here is the beta, and this one is for the gamma. For the second is atomic number and mass number are conserved. We need to remember this as all the questions, if we remember that it is conserved, it will be easy to, de to do it. So for the third tip is we need to memorize the reaction energy equation, which is this e equation actually the same as E equal to mc square. And I'm not going to cover for this part because in Amir Hazik's presentation, the example that he has given is actually good enough for us to refer. <laughs> okay. okay, let's take a look at example of the questions. I'm going to divide the question into two parts. Uh, for, for the first two questions, we, we are going to do together. And for the few questions in the second part, I want some volunteer to answer it. Okay, so for the first question, in the decay of this equation, we need to identify what is the mass number and the atomic number of Fr nucleus. So like I was said before, we need to understand that all this equation it is in conserve. So in order to calculate for the mass number, we need to understand that conserve means the atomic number before the reaction and after the reaction must be equal. So here, the atomic number, which is the Z, uh, 89 is the before and equal to Z plus 2. And then we do the mass calculation and we get the Z equal to 97. This same goes to the mass number, which is the number before equal to the total number and after the reaction. Then we will get the A, the A value. So for the second question, some of the question may ask us just like this. It just gives this equation and we need to understand what is to answer. Meaning we need to find the atomic number and the mass number and what's the atom. So like first we need to use that it is conserved. Then we calculate the atomic number, which is the 13 plus two. This is before the reaction equal to the after reaction, the unknown plus zero. Then we get the Z equal to the 15 and this same goes to the mass number. We get the A equal to 30. And in order to find what the atom is, we need to refer back to the periodic table, which is in chemistry we have used it before. And I have inserted it in the next slide. So like, like uh, the question before, the atomic, the atomic number is 15 and for the mass number is 13. So we need to find the atomic number here and this is 15 and for the mass number is 13. Thus we get that the element is phosphorus. So let's for the second part, let's try by ourselves because uh, if we does not practice, we're not sure that do we understand or not. So here is the first question. Could I get some volunteer to answer for my question? Do anyone know what is the answer?
Hello, 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 hello. Hmm? Does anyone know the answer? This is just an easy one to say, guys. So if we do like the conservation, then we get the answer is for anyone that I calculate, the answer is actually this one. The mass number is 96 and the atomic number is 37. And the element is rubidium. So let's proceed to the next question. And for this question, we just need to make an equation from the question. And we need to understand that uh, which one is the product and which one is the reactant. So do anyone know the answer? I'm Razik want to answer. <laughs> Okay, so for the answer, okay, I give you guys the answer already. So here is for the answer, we just make this equation. And for the neutron bombardment, we need to know that the mass number is 1, the atomic number is 0. Then we go to the third question. The alpha particle and a product nucleus are produced when this natrium is struck by a proton. This means that this element is struck by a proton and producing a nucleus, an alpha particle. So what is the nucleus? Is it neon 20? I'm sorry? Uh, neon 20. Well, let's look at the answer. I think you might be true. Yep, that's the correct answer. Thank you, Shasha, for answering. So here's the last question for my presentation. This is just easy question. Do even know that from these three, which one are the correct possible reaction? A and B. Yep, that's true. Thank you, Mariam, for the answer. Well, I think that is just for me. So like I was saying before, that the question is actually just easy. We need to understand that it is in conserve. Hope you guys understand on how to do the question. Thank you. Thank you, Umar. That was good. Uh, next one is... Uh, uh, Yen E. Yen E. Uh, and Divya. Doctor, Doctor Divya and Afrina will be presenting first because I'm presenting the question part. Mm. Good afternoon, right. Doctor. I will be presenting first. Okay, all the best. Uh, doctor, can you hear me clearly? Um, ja, cuba check up. Good afternoon, Doctor. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can doctor see my screen? Not yet, Divya. No, doctor? Mm, not yet. Oh, uh, doctor cannot see anything, uh, is it? Ah, uh, nothing. Oh, okay. Korang, uh, korang lain nampak tak? Nampak. Nampak. Tadi. Sekarang tak? Oh, nampak. Eh, sekarang tak? Tadi nampak. Wait, now? Okay, now I boleh. Yep. Okay. Just a moment, doctor. Let me... Mama. Can you close the door, dude? Oh, sorry. I'm going to mute. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, doctor, I'm going to start. So, warm greetings to Dr. Nadia and my fellow friends. So, this is me, Vivia. We'll be presenting one of the very important subtopic in the chapter uh, 24, nuclear physics. So I'll be talking more on the nuclear fission, one of the significant reactions uh, of the nuclear. So let's get started. Uh, 
So for the learning outcome, so learning outcome is very important because it sets the target, um, like what are we going to learn about in the chapter. So for the nuclear fission, the learning outcome is very easy because it's all about explaining the theory of the nuclear fission, how it happens and what you know is in there. Uh, there are no calculations involved in nuclear fusion. Like you don't have to use your calculator exactly. It's all about writing the theory. So let's get started. And also, we have already learned the nuclear fusion in SPM. So it's this will be quite like a refreshing part in, uh, in SLC. So let's go to the first part. So the contents here will be uh, about the overview. So let's just like refresh our mind of what will be the nuclear fusion. And Jaya has already explained this. But I'll go a little deeper into what is nuclear fission, right? So next, we will be looking at what is nuclear fission and what it involves and so on. Then uh, I'll be sharing about what is chain reaction and then controlled nuclear fission and uncontrolled nuclear fission. So let's go to the part number one, the overview of the nuclear fission. So just now, Nadira and Jaya have already showed this, but look at it carefully again because we have to get something from here. Look at the labels carefully. So here, the clues we can get are neutron, neutron bombardment, then the light here, the nuclear splitting, and then fission fragments, neutrons. So the light there was the energy. So next, what is nuclear fission? So nuclear fission is that a nuclear reaction in which a heavy nucleus or a massive nucleus, so this heavy nucleus is actually unstable, splits into two smaller nuclei. So this smaller nuclei uh, actually has a lesser mass compared to the heavier nucleus and it's quite stable, okay? And we call them as uh, fission products or fission fragments. And this happens by the absorption of the neutron. So the initiation power over here is that the bombardment of the neutron or the absorption of neutron by the target nucleus. So the keyword here is that splitting. So just remember, fission is splitting. Now, so you can uh, get, get a picture of what is nuclear fission by looking at this diagram. So it's very simple, one neutron and the target nucleus, and then they come together. Then the light you saw just now was the release of energy and we'll be having products, fission products, and the neutrons. Neutrons are not called the products, they are just being emitted. So they are the emissions. Okay, now from this diagram, we can conclude this reaction with this equation, a very simple equation. But this is a process, equa uh, process uh, equation uh, uh, of the reaction, but it's not the exact reaction you're gonna write as an answer. This is just to understand what's happening there. So neutron and a nucleus, then we will be having this product. This is not the um, exact product or the final product. This is an intermediate state of the U235 nucleus that lasts only for 10 picoseconds. So that's very less time before splitting into the fission fragments. And now this X and Y can be any combination. So here we see barium and krypton. So it can be anything else, anything. So the, there are combinations, there are around 90 different combinations. Okay, now let's go to a typical nuclear fission reaction. So one neutron, U235 nucleus, then we get barium, krypton, and three neutrons. So the facts that we have to bear in our mind are the total mass of the product. So I said these two are the products. So products, if you sum up their mass, which is 141 and 92, it will be lesser than the original mass, the 235 of the heavy nucleus. And you might be wondering where the balance mass went. So Einstein told, Einstein told us that the missing mass has been converted into the energy. That's a separate equation, but we are not gonna learn that here. And each fission produces an average of 200 mega electron volt of energy. And if you're wondering how much is that, actually that amount of energy is about 100 million times the energy released in the combustion of uh, a molecule of octane used in gasoline engine. That's really a lot and huge. And then we'll be having two or three neutrons uh, emitted in every reaction. So why is it not a fixed number or they, they're saying it's two, either two or three. So that's because, okay, just now uh, Umar uh, and I think Nadira was explaining about like uh, balancing the equation, right? We're using the periodic table and so on, like you see. So if you plus two, three, five and one over here, you will get two, three, six. So the same thing goes over here, right? One for one and nine, two. So the balance one 
you need to balance by uh, inserting either two or three neutrons. So if you have a balanced mass over here and uh, on the left side and the right side together with the proton number considered uh, same at both sides, then we will, you will get the right number of neutrons. Like maybe it can be three or two. So next. So that was like a theoretical one. If you want to like a real picture of uh, the energy itself, so we have to look at this schematic representation of the nuclear fusion. This is based on the energy. So it's a very simple thing. So let's say this is a particular amount of energy. And here the U235 is quite unstable. So when the neutron comes and you know hits the nucleus, so you will be having a very unstable uranium because it's no more 235, it's 236, the star one. So it's unstable. Then what happens is that the fission happens. When fission happens, a large amount of energy will be released. So that is the net energy output. Then you will be having, when the energy all have been dissipated, then you'll be having more stable fission products and either two or three neutrons. So this will be the reaction part. Then this one is easy to understand about the energy, energy flow over here. Now, this is the sequence of events in nuclear fission process. For your information, the nuclear fission is described as liquid drop model. Okay, I'll tell you why. So let's see the first, um, uh, let's see the process first. Lah. A slow neutron approaches uh, U235 nucleus. And you have to always know that uh, for the fission to occur, we need a slow neutron. We cannot have a fast neutron because it's quite difficult for the U235 nucleus to capture it. So we need a slow neutron. So when the slow neutron approaches it, the U2, U235 nucleus will capture the neutron. So it will result in the formation of U star or U intermediate or U236, uh, which is an excited state of U235 nucleus. So the nucleus will deform, deform and oscillates like a liquid drop. So this is why they say it's like a liquid drop model. So you can see like a dumbbell, dumbbell shape over here before it splits, right before it splits. So that's why they say it's like a liquid drop. Then the nucleus will split into two fragments, uh, which will be lighter in mass. Then it will also emit uh, several neutrons, so it's like two or three neutrons. So now chain reaction in nuclear fission. Okay, now what is chain reaction? Chain reaction is basically a process in which the neutrons that was initially released in the first fission produce the next fission in at least one further nucleus, right? So it's like consequently, this nucleus will produce neutrons and the process repeats. Bits. So it's just to simply put, we can just say they are just like consequent fission process happening one after another. Now, chain reaction can be destructive and can be constructive also. If it's constructive, that means if it wants to do good to us, we can take it that way. So it is called the control uh, chain reaction. If it's going to do bad to us, it is uncontrolled nuclear uh, uh, uncontrolled nuclear fission uh, with the concept of chain reaction. We will see the examples later. Now, this is the diagram of how it happens. So the, the, the product, the, new, the neutrons from the first fission will go and hit the next uh, nucleus and it just continues that way. Uh, it's like a series of fission, one after another. Okay, this is a very common lab representation of the chain reaction, if you can see here. It's like one impacting the other. I think we can see in a faster mode here. Sorry, sorry, slower mode. So we can here clearly see that one will impact the other and it just continues like that. But whether it's controlled or not, or controlled or uncontrolled depends on the application. Oops. First, let's go to the control nuclear fission. So to maintain a sustained control reaction for every two or three neutrons released, only one neutron must be allowed to strike another uranium nucleus. So the ratio is going to be one. If it is less than one, that means no neutrons uh, attacking the next nucleus, so the reaction will die out. So it's not going to be a chain reaction. But if it's more than one neutron uh, uh, continuing the process of nuclear fission, then it grows uncontrollably. So it's called the atomic explosion. So as we know, the fast moving electron, uh, sorry, neutrons should be slowed down for the nucleus to capture it. And this application has been used in nuclear power plants uh, to generate the electrical energy. Now, 
Second one is that uncontrolled nuclear fission. So the amount of energy produced will be very large in a very shorter time in uncontrolled nuclear fission. So uncontrolled nuclear fission is the exact same of the controlled nuclear fission, just that it's not one neutron involved in the next process, but more than one neutron will be working for the next fusion. So the, the example is atomic bomb or any bomb, any bomb. Now, let's just recap, just, just a very, um, like, like a, just a small recap about it. To simply put, I would say that uh, the for the uncontrolled and controlled phase, they are just like a normal uh, subsequent uh, nuclear fission happening one after another is just one is controlled manner because you always remember only one neutron is involved. But if you go to uncontrolled nuclear fission, more than one neutron, just we can just say it's like a nosy Parker, like busybody. What, uh, it, it wants to join the first nucleus to go and make some mass. So if atomic bomb is a mass, then you just imagine that more than one neutrons are involved and that is uncontrolled nuclear fission. And always remember fission is splitting. So I think that is all about my presentation. And I hope this one has opened your mind like more about nuclear fission and has refreshed your existing knowledge on nuclear fission. Thank you very much. Thanks, Divya. Well done. That was really good, like a lecture. I felt like I, le I learned a lot. <laughs> okay, next one. <laughs> next one is, is it Afrina? Yes, Dr. All right. All the best. Yeah, um, Assalamualaikum and a very good day to Dr. Nair and my fellow friends. My name is Nura Afrina Shamimi bin Jumamah Shafaduri. My metric number is S12034 and today I will be presenting on the differences between control and uncontrolled change reaction and the application. So what is the difference between control and uncontrolled change reaction? So a uh, controlled chain reaction is a chain of nuclear reaction that takes place subsequently under controlled condition. Why? An uncontrolled chain reaction is a chain of nuclear reaction that takes place subsequently, but not under controlled condition. So the component of uh, a chain, a controlled chain reaction is carried out in the presence of moderators, but an uncontrolled chain reaction is carried out in the absence of moderator. So for the control measures, a nuclear chain reaction is converted into a control chain reaction via regulating the amount of PSI isotopes present, reducing the time of reaction and using moderators. Why? An uncontrolled chain reaction has no control measures. So that's why we call it as uncontrolled chain reaction. So um, for the application, Controlled chain reactions are used in nuclear power plants to generate electricity, while uncontrolled chain reactions are used in nuclear bombs. Okay, so uh, for the application of nuclear fissions, which is divided into two parts, uh, controlled and uncontrolled. So for the nuclear reactor, which is the example of a uh, nuclear fission control, a nuclear reactor, formerly known as an atomic part, is a device used to initiate and control a fission nuclear chain reaction. Nuclear reactors are used at nuclear power plants for electricity generation and in nuclear marine propulsion. Next, um, in nuclear reactors, the rate of fission has to be carefully controlled to stop it from getting out of control. This is mainly achieved by control loads, this, which can be lowered into the reactors to absorb neutrons and to slow down the reaction. Uh, and then the energy released from this process is used to heat up water and turn it into steam, which can drive turbines that are connected to electricity generators. Um, moving on to uncontrolled nuclear fusion. So these two are the the example of um, uncontrolled nuclear fission, which is um, example of atomic bomb. So uh, this one, a gun type bomb, 
His design consisted of a gun that fired one mass of uranium-235 at another mass of uranium-235, thus creating a supercritical mass. A crucial requirement was that the pieces be brought together in a time shorter than the between spontaneous fissions. Once the two pieces of uranium are brought together, the initiator introduced a burst of neutrons and the chain reactions begin, continuing until the energy release becomes so great that the bomb simply blows itself apart. Next, for the implosion type of bomb, it is uh, designed for the plutonium bomb was also based on using a simple gun design like the uranium bomb. And this gun type bomb would not be fast enough to work. So before the bomb could be assembled, a few stray neutrons would have been emitted from the spontaneous fission. And this would start a premature generation leading to a great reduction in the energy release. So that's all for me, thank you. Thank you, Afrina. That was good. Kelas saya tak ajar pasal bom, eh, Cik. Jangan pergi apply this knowledge kat tempat, kat luar. Okay, so moving on, it's Hidayah. Hidayah, kan? Or is it Aina? Dr. Aihwan presented for the question. Oh, E&E, sorry. Terlepas. Okay, guys. Uh, doctor, my line is a bit lagging today, so hopefully uh, it can make it through. Yeah, don't turn on your video lah, okay? Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Yen Yi. My matrix number is AS11870. Good afternoon to Dr. Nadia and friends. So I'll be presenting the nuclear fission questions. I'll be having two questions later. So for the first question, we have to find the energy release in the fission reaction below. This is actually the reaction energy. We have to find the reaction energy. So there is two methods to do this actually. First is the one that uh, E equals to delta mc square. So these are the atomic masses of elements involved. It is given in question. As I've mentioned just now, uh, that is the first uh, solution to do it. So this is the second solution. We can apply this to Q equals to the, the initial re reactants minus the products ones times the C square. So we just have to ap uh, apply all the masses given just now into the equation. So after we apply all the masses into it, so this is the findings, 0.205893U. So to eliminate U, so we have to put in this constant. This is actually a constant. So we just have to multiply this into this equation. So at the end, we'll be, uh, we'll be finding this answer, 191M788 uh, uh, mega EV. So proceed to the second question. A typical nuclear fission power plant produces about one gigawatt of electrical power. Assume the plant has an overall efficiency of 40% and each fission produces 200 mega EV of thermal energy. Calculate the mass of uranium consumed each day. So how to do this? This is actually an extra question, uh, which is, uh, not provided in the book, in the module. So this is the way that we can do it. So we have to find the energy input first. For the energy input, this is the equation. P times T over efficiency. Power is given just now. And we have to times one day. And this is the efficiency given just now. So after all, We'll be finding this answer 1.35 times 10 to the power of 27 mega EV. So for the N, N is this is the equation for N uh, energy input over energy coefficient. So at the end, we just have to put in all the all the answers we have given from the uh, from the question just now. This one is from the question. This one is uh, energy coefficient 200 mega EV per atom. And this one is what we have found just now. So at the end, we'll be finding the answer 
times 10 to the 24 of atoms. So, hence, to solve the uranium mass number, this is the solution given. So we have to use, uh, we have to use just now the, we have been finding the N right just now. We have to divide it by the Avogadro's constant. And in the end, we'll be finding this, which is 2.63 times 10 to the power of three grams. So this is the final answer. So this is all for me. Thank you. Thanks, Yan E. Okay, next one. Good job. Uh, next one is Gaya or Aina Nabila or Nurhan. Derulu. Okay, all the best. Ah, okay, sorry, sorry. Ah, jump eh. Ah, ah, hello, doctor, boleh dengar tak? Boleh. Okay. Um, assalamualaikum and a wonderful afternoon. I beat to doctor Nat and my classmate. So today I would like to present about nuclear reaction, which is nuclear fusion. So. What is nuclear fusion? Nuclear fusion is a process whereby two nucleus and relatively small binding energy per nucleon combine to form a larger nucleus that has higher binding energy per nucleon. Next, this is the characteristic of nuclear fusion. Uh, generally, fusion reaction requires extremely high temperature. Then the nuclear fusion reaction requires two light nuclei fused to form a single larger nucleus and release a substantial amount of energy. Uh, okay, so now let's go more deeper and simpler concept of nuclear fusion. In this slide, we're looking at nuclear fusion, which is when two like the nuclei join or fuse to form a single larger nuclear. For example, two hydrogen nuclei like hydrogen one and hydrogen two will fuse together to form helium three. This process releases tons of energy and this is how elements heavier than hydrogen were made. The reason why fusion produces such large amounts of energy is because of some of the mass of the original nuclei. In this case, those two hydrogens are being converted to energy rather than transferred to a new helium nucleus. Another great thing about nuclear fusion is that it doesn't produce any radioactive waste and hydrogen can easily produce to be used as a fuel. The issue now is that if fusion only happens at really high temperatures and pressures as in 10 million degrees Celsius, nuclear fusion can't occur on Earth, but there is a lot of experimental research going into discovering how we could do it one day. Um, that's all for me, thank you. Okay, thanks Hidaya, well done. Uh, Aina or Nurhan, next. Uh, yes, sorry. Assalamu and a very good day to everyone. Um, today I will present about the example of nuclear fusion using real compound. So, uh, nuclear fusion in the sun. Uh, a good example of fusion reaction 
happening in real life is the sun. So during this vision, a lot of energy is produced both in form of light and heat, which reach the earth in the form of sun ray. So fusion reaction constitute the fundamental energy source of stars, including sun. So fusion in the core of the sun produce the sun's energy at the very high. type of fusion that occurs inside of the sun is known as proton-proton fusion. Putus-putus lah, Aina. Kita tunggu sekejap eh. Kita okay, cuba Aina cakap. Okay, Aina is not there. Okay, iklanlah dulu sebab Aina hilang. So tomorrow, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, will be open will be open for people who are under 60. So you guys, that, I'm not sure if you guys are already 18. Are you guys already 18? But if you guys are, you can register for that lah if you want the vaccination to be faster. If not, you can make your siblings or your uncles, aunties yang below 60, above 18 to be aware of this, they can go to um, Bisingnya, saya punya background They can go to the website to register for AstraZeneca starting from 12pm tomorrow For today and yesterday, it's only above 60 For tomorrow, after 12pm, it's below 60 years old So if you want your siblings to be, get vaccinated or your parents or anyone that you know that is under 60, please let them know about the vaccination. Uh, let's try to get the herd immunity in action uh, as soon as possible so that we can live uh, normal lives. Eh? So I already got my first dose and I'm looking forward to my next one. Lah. Walaupun saya kena side effect agak teruk sikit, tapi tak apa. It's for the, untuk semua orang lah kan, kita berkorban lah sikit. Okay. So is Aina back? Yes. Okay. So Aina boleh continue eh? Is Aina kat rumah or hostel? Rumah doktor. Oh rumah. Okay. Okay, Aina is back, tapi muted. Okay, tak apa, Aina relax. Just take your time. And after this, you okay. guys have to submit. Okay, go for it. Okay. So, I will repeat. Um, so, uh, inside the sun, this process begin with process. And it will that this.
Okay. Um, it is important that that we take a note that the core is the only part of the sun that produce any signal. Sun is heated by energy transferred outward from the core. So in this process, that's of. I know I tak dengar. Uh, I know what we can do. Can you uh, record yourself on WhatsApp pakai voice note to explain this slide and then hantar dekat group saya akan play. Sebab yang tu pakai data sikit. You know boleh tak? You record yourself using voice note on WhatsApp to explain this um Okay, she's gone to explain this slide. Okay, tak perasa yang message Aina. Siannya internet, it's not good. Nanti macam nak buat exam. Uh, Aina, please record yourself. This voice note. Hmm. Okay, so um, I'm going to wait for Aina to do her voice record. Uh, we can start with Nurhan, would you presentation? Nurhan, ready? Uh, ready, ready. Okay, all the best. Uh, Doktor boleh nampak slide kan? Boleh, alright. Uh, hello and good afternoon to Doktor Nat and my fellow friends. So my name is Ahmad Nurhan Amsha and my number matrix is AS12285. So I will presenting about the difference between nuclear fusion and nuclear fusion. So for nuclear fusion, nuclear fusion is to like nuclear join or fuse to form a single larger nuclei, nuclear. So uh, in this diagram, we can see two light nuclei combined together, fuse together, become the heavier nuclear. Meanwhile, for nuclear fusion, the large unstable nuclei are split into two smaller nuclei. So basically, uh, analogy ni, fusion ni macam kecil jadi besar, manakala fusion ni besar jadi kecil. So uh, for for the nuclear fusion, from the nuclear fusion, it will release a ton of energy. This is because uh, it really need high temperature and pressures as in 10 million degrees Celsius. So uh, this is why we can do nuclear fusion in Earth. But nowadays, there are a lot of experiment and research are going to discovering how could we can do a nuclear fusion one day. So for nuclear fusion, it also produces a lot of energy, but not as much as fusion. So the nuclear, fusion, the nuclear fusion is a nuclear fusion that we can use on Earth to generate electricity. But for the nuclear fusion, uh, it only happens inside stars. But as I mentioned just now, it also have a experiment and research to the nucleification one day. Uh, so this is one of the experiment, which is nuclear fusion generator. So it's a plenary reactor in Britain is also gearing up to start pivotal test of a full mix that will eventually power ITR, the world's biggest nuclear fusion experiment. So the nuclear fusion experiment is the phenomenon that powers the sun. And if the physicists can harness it on Earth, 
it will be a source of almost limitless energy. So I think that's all from me. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks Nurhan. Well done everyone. Dah siap dah. So now what you can do is submit your presentation or your summary on Putra Blast. Nanti I will put it in a Google Drive and I will share it with uh, the group so that everyone Mommy. can refer yeah everyone can refer to the summary for your Mommy. final assignment later okay so boleh study dululah the material that your friends prepared before you go for the final assignment the final assignment is on Friday to Sunday this Friday to Sunday it's open book meaning to say you can search the internet you can use your book use your textbook but it's not open to discussion so please have your discussions please try to understand before you start attempting the final assignment um other than that i think on kamis if you guys have not done your lab please complete your lab on thursday otherwise this is our last class okay so much as a discate tapi tak apa i'm going to ask everyone to have like a voice record on flipgrid later so that kita ada macam memory sikit lah, acah-acah memory kan. Okay, so um, I'll talk to you guys later. As always, I'm available on WhatsApp. You have questions, just shoot me a WhatsApp. Uh, take care, don't forget to jaga SOP and I will be missing you guys. Uh, it has been a very, very nice experience teaching you all. Uh, walaupun kita ada our differences, but I think we made the best out of the semester walaupun tak pernah berjumpa. I really enjoyed my time with you guys. So take care. I hope to see you guys around in the future. Kita semua kat UPM. So nanti jumpa saya tegur. Kalau saya tak ingat, korang cakap oh saya daripada K19. Bagi tahulah sebab saya ramai student. <laughs> okay. So tu je lah. Yeah. Yeah. Gambar. Tapi kan saya tak, tak pakai tudung. <laughs> nanti kan um, oh. what I'm thinking is I'm going to have you guys to record yourself and ada picture on Flipgrid for memories. Boleh tak macam tu? Instead of like tangkap gambar. Nanti kasihlah ucapan dekat classmates, ucapan dekat saya on that platform. Okay? So later nanti saya kasih. Okay. Okay, bye guys. Take care. All the best. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. 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 Thank you, Doctor. Bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Welcome. Nanti jangan lupa record. Thank you, Doctor. Record apa? Record uh, ucapan. Oh. <laughs> later, later. I'll tell you guys. Uh -huh. uh, nak cakap uh, Maafkan kami kalau kami ada buat salah kat doktor Macam tak kerja lambat ke Ataupun uh, Kacau doktor tengah malam Pilih yang doktor tanya soalan ke Oh tak apa Saya tak pernah <laughs> terasa Tak pernah ambil hati pun All is forgiven And I always pray for you guys Okay uh, Ada yang ter ter terbelutik kat doktor <laughs> <laughs> Tu selalu tu <laughs> Okay bye Makan kami nak tu. Okay.